and that we involve stakeholders. Currently down on the downtown board association, um, Catherine and Bill did the best that they could, but then helping stakeholders to change from statistics, dealing with probation, dealing with disability piece, we have a really good plan. And then I was appointed by um, our supervisor, Parker, I didn't want to assume that position because it dealt with the status. When I have, I have a consciousness. My son died from homelessness and disability, but it when he went to turning point, they sent him away. There was no access to medication. I was concerned for the supervisor, I mean, for, and Parker, that if they would do things right, that we comply and follow what Mayor Don do, and Simone Salinas put together. It's a beautiful plan. And in dealing with the ordinance, there was supposed to be an interagency council of homelessness. Before that, we move forward on ordinance. I want underneath health and safety for it to deal with humanity. I want the standards to reflect. And I want things that have been um, put together, like the tents by the garden, to be respected. I want that as that we work towards Ray Bullock's vision for health equity for everyone, because I'm on a part of the, the committee that it deals with cultural relevancy and cultural humility that deals with homeless as a culture that is protected and is codified. I am feeling very concerned that before that El Nino comes, that we return and that we follow through with in interdisciplinary language. I called Simone Salinas. <coughs> I, called, uh, I called your office, Mr. Armenta, and I called your office, Mr. Parker, because now that people are not understanding what environmental impact means. If we follow housing first and apply it to it, not only will we do a vulnerability index, but you will include those of us like with the um, cultural relevance and cultural humility committee that meets once a month and is working towards environmental, uh, the um, health, public health and uh, cultural relevancy with Carmen Gill and the Laquana Williams. I am, I've been on um, that work group and used to be cultural, cultural, cult, cultural competencies, but with cultural relevancy and um, us uh, writing the Mental Health Service Act and us reviewing policies, practices, and procedures. I've also went to community correction partnership um, meetings and even though that we had a meeting at the juvenile hall, I asked the community board supervisors, so due diligence and governance is applied to the federal staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments uh, for matters not on today's agenda? Then it takes three minutes. Good morning. My name is Enrique Mendes Flores. I am a taxpayer here in the city of Salinas and um, the property owner. I have been attending the council meetings of our city, and this past uh, Tuesday, as Ms. Uh, Pamela mentioned, the city of Salinas passed an ordinance that I consider it to be heartless. Uh, yesterday, uh, Wednesday, I observed a man that appeared to be perhaps in a not in mental health status standing on the corner of Bernal and North Main, about to either cross the uh, intersection and perhaps be um, hit by an automobile. Uh, I consider the ordinance despite that some of the members express extreme compassion about the situation about the homeless uh, to be once again heartless because how can they consider how can they express concern and how can they express uh, compassion and they pass an ordinance that makes no sense whatsoever to me because what's going to happen is that these folks where are they going to go? What's going to happen to them? So they're going to go on to private property because now that the city that passed this ordinance, they cannot be able to the city property. So they're going to go on to private property. What's going to happen to them? So I think that you folks that are uh, in charge of agencies concerned about the health of our, of our folks, the mental health of our folks, need to be aware of what's going on here in the city of Salinas. It's supposed to be uh, number one on the, on the homeless according to a report that was given to the board of supervisors not too long ago. So thank you very much for your time, and I hope you take care of this issue. Any other comments? Any 
have a profit plan for matters not on today's agenda? Uh, actually, just try to find an agenda. I, I'm not sure if you're on it or not. Uh, about the ordinance, is that on the agenda, the city's ordinance? No, no, that's, we, that's, let me explain one thing about this committee, okay? This committee's been in existence for 10 years. Subcommittee on Health and Human Services Board of We do not, we do not make policy in this committee. We review progress reports of, of the health department, the Tibidab Medical Center, social services, uh, violence, gang violence, uh, a number of things that I'm today. And what we do is hear progress reports and any recommendations or suggestions that come out of this committee uh, uh, gets forwarded to the full board of supervisors. Uh, this, this, as far as I know, which county council? As far as I know, the board of supervisors uh, does not have, stand to be correct, it does not have jurisdiction over city, any of the 12 city ordinances of any kind. So we cannot uh, override anything they decide to do regarding any matters that have to do with the rules, budget, ordinances. Speaking, you have statistics. You have to have statistics. You can research it. Okay. So, right. go ahead. Uh, okay, but this will directly impact those reports in the, in the near future. Uh, it's the ordinance. I'm not asking you to overturn it or anything like that. Uh, but you, you do need to... I've heard there's discussions uh, coming, right? Uh, we're going to continue the discussion. Apparently, the city says it's the county's problem, and they don't care where people go, just as long as they're not on city property. If they leave St. Louis, they'd be even happier. Yet, this is the county seat. And you guys are responsible for services, apparently, because you deal with people and they deal with property. So, uh, what's happening is we're getting a blatant uh, disregard in, uh, of people's quality of life. <laughs> uh, people's uh, health wait, wait, uh, and welfare. Wait, 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 wait. We're not going to have yeah. any interruptions. If we are to conduct, run this meeting today and have this meeting today, it cannot be with interruptions. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. If you want to speak, you wait your turn, you, you ask to be acknowledged, and actually state your name. So, okay. did you, do we have no, That's very fair. Uh, uh, I said that's very fair. What, what is your name? Uh, my name is Wes White, uh, okay. Salinas okay. resident. And uh, community enthusiasts, I suppose. I, and I'm, I'm just concerned about people with no shelter because of this ordinance. I'm sure you're aware of it. Uh, it will give them 24 hour notice and no notice at all to take personal property. And, and they call it bulky items, not personal property, so they can take that without any kind of due process or storage. Uh, and people without shelter, they're going to end up wet. This is El Nino this year, it's the winter months right now. And uh, when, when this goes into effect, it'll be just a, a week before Christmas when they're ready to do this. And uh, showing a, a severe lack of compassion. And this is where I'm looking to the county and the county services, social services, health services. These are all going to get severely impacted when, once this ordinance goes into effect. Uh, and, and these will be impacting the reports. So this is why I'm trying to have you do some forward thinking about it and uh, do some kind of preparation because it is coming down the pipe in just a couple months. Uh, so we need to be ready for that. I would also ask to uh, get another audience with, with county supervisors, social services, the mental behavioral health, uh, any and all, uh, and bring the actual people who are affected to that table. Uh, because, you know, the CHSB is there, but we, it'd, it'd be great to also have the, the people who are directly affected as well. Okay, um, this is, uh, any other public comment? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to dispense with, from the action minutes, I'm going to dispense with following as we have scheduled the agenda. And we're going to go right to number four, uh, which is up on the screen now. And that's, that's on page three. This is a time to receive an oral report and proposal from the Coalition of Homelessness Services Providers for the development of a coordinated assessment and referral system for homelessness services and provide direction to county departments to support the success of the project 
Mr. Rigwell, my understand, has an appointment. He will be here at 10. So, Elliot Robinson, who's going to take off? Also, 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 he managed the assistant health director. So, who's going to take the lead on this one? Let me start off with this uh, proposal. So, we've been working with um, you know, the, the, the community at large, but, but specifically through the coalition of, of uh, homeless services providers. And um, some of this is also having I mean, some conversations with the city. So, we need to start around building a better system for coordination of services for uh, homeless individuals in our community. The concept of coordination and runs the spectrum from in, working with individual people who are um, experiencing homelessness, provide case management and support for access and services to systemic coordination, which is to kind of look across the shelter and uh, and corollary services that we have, the uh, income assistance. Um, to establish a system that would uh, coordinate individual case managers around providing services. And so in that conversation, what um, really became clear is that there are several reasons that putting into place a coordinated assessment and referral system has lots of value. One is, rather than having individual knowledge about this this shelter might have vacancies, that might shelter might have vacancies, and I'm working with an individual. Um, there's a lot of value to say, you know, put on, on a table for all the case managers to see where are their vacancies, and also for case managers to work through the vulnerability assessments of the individual so you can prioritize use of those, um, those resources to shelter. So that's one, just having a systemic process to utilize what we have in the homeless management information system, um, what we have kind of as ancillary services outside of the homeless management information system, example being the Google Hub, you know, what's available through the healthcare system, examples being what's available through the social services system um, in that environment. The second piece that's very important is the um, uh, Federal Housing and Urban Development Department, along with Department of Veterans Affairs has put a new requirement on continuing care funding, which is the foundation of our shelter system, that we must have a coordinated assessment system or else your funding for the very shelter system we have becomes strong. So kind of two, two pieces come to play here, right? One is preserving what we have. Um, and then an optimistic side maybe making what we can get a little bit more competitive. Um, and practically, establishing a coordinated system for assessment and referral. So that's the idea that we talked about when we had conversations with some of the jurisdictions to say, you know, we need you know, other folks to you know, support setting up around within our public cities and our public jurisdictions, the, the services that individual residents becomes a, a priority for that jurisdiction and, and pay attention to um, we're willing to support where we can, but our first priority is to make sure there's an overarching system in place. So we've had conversations with the Coalition of Homeless Services providers to bring forward a proposal, um, to bring forward a proposal that has support of both their board, which is their member agencies are the homeless shelter um, providers that um, are funded to continue with care. And, um, and let us, as a and let you as a committee consider it and then give us as county department heads some direction on you know, should we continue this conversation, should we improve the conversation, um, but that it is valued to put in place a, 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 systemic, a, a systemic response to the uh, service coordination. With that, I'd like to introduce Catherine Turney from the Executive Direction, Director of the Coalition of Public Services Providers, to go into a little bit more detail about their proposal for part. Thank you, Elliot. Um, my name is Catherine Turney. I'm the Executive Officer of the Homeless Coalition. And, um, you know, first and foremost, I really want to thank the Board of Supervisors for kind of spurring this discussion uh, a handful of months ago 
and the county and jurisdictional staff who have really come to the table to move this conversation forward. It has been, um, uh, it has been very focused, results driven, and I think that um, uh, the, the proposed deliverables that you'll see are um, wise. So, you just point to my so, so, before you do that, um, and I apologize, oh, that's um, uh, uh, not for what, what you're presenting, um, uh, and I mean, I just realized, and I have a consultant with employees of Parker, um, because of the nature of what we're discussing, and, and I think there's a a fair amount of urgency involved that um, unless I get um, um, an exception or or a concern that we're going to have to probably just because we need enough time for this and follow up discussion and questions and suggestions. And uh, we may have to use the majority of our committee time just on homelessness this morning and dispense with everything else. Possibly we meet quarterly. With, if we need to, we'll move all these other items unless they're time sensitive and have a special meeting next month just on the other items that have directly nothing to do for the most part on homelessness. So, Unless I hear an exception or concern, we're going to spend the bulk of our time uh, doing this and deal with that. And I apologize for doing that just because uh, I don't. I uh, we have seven or six, six or seven other items, and we're going to be starting to crush uh, for time. And uh, folks are going to walk out of here. Uh, we thought they were frustrated walking in here today. They're going to say, well, we only got so much, we didn't get enough time. So I don't know what your thoughts on that. Yeah, we can see how the time looks. Okay. So go ahead. Thank you. I, I will try to move through this. <coughs> I, I don't want, I don't, the other thing, I, I don't want for the sake of because it's urgent and it's, it, and it's critical. It, it's nothing new that we woke up to today either. And, and, and that is, is I don't want to rush you or anybody else in terms of what we need to say. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I have to interrupt. Let me check with all the other departments while you're presenting. And I'll make sure that the ones that we need to do what we need to. I think one of them, I think, should be moved to the next month. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. So, um, as, as Elliot briefly discussed, the Mandates and regulations uh, from federal agencies have greatly changed and expanded in the last handful of years. Um, you know, it used to be as the county's continuum of care coordinator coalition um, focused a lot on the HUD continuum of care program and the associated mandates and requirements that, that, that are attached to that. But over the last three years, um, HUD, the Veterans Administration, ESG, HCD have all come together through multiple converse, national conversations and state conversations to mirror the same sort of requirements. So for example, when Elliot talks about um, HUD requiring a coordinated, a coordinated assessment system, that is a quadruple requirement. Not just from HUD, but from ESG, from the Veterans Administration, from AC. Um, and again, as the continuum of care coordinator, it falls to the coalition to kind of manage and navigate the community through that very complicated maze to make sure that the resources that are needed can flow into the community uh, that will address ha uh, homelessness, which is a multifaceted extraordinary, com extraordinarily complicated challenge um, to address, which is why it really has pleased me that the Board of Supervisors and the 
county and, and, the, and the jurisdictions that are mostly impacted um, have all come to the same conclusion that having that single point of coordinated, that single coordinated um, entity will break down silos and help move us forward. So having said all of that preface work, um, you know, I come to you today with um, expansion activities for the coalition that are county-wide, through the county. These are not expansion proposals that are focused on one jurisdiction, one area within a jurisdiction. They are county-wide. Um, uh, and the first has to deal with coordinated assessment and referral system, known as CARS, also known as coordinated entry. And Ellie, if you would click through that. Thank you. So, uh, coordinated entry has multiple phases to it. Um, the philosophy behind coordinated entry is that it takes the typical way in which homeless individuals and families enter and are enrolled in homeless programs, which have been traditionally based upon a wait list. I have a shelter, it has 20 beds, the 21st person is on the wait list, I get an opening, that 21st person comes in. For decades, that was an established practice <coughs> what almost everybody in the country did. The coordinated uh, entry requirement, though, flips that on its ear, and it says no. Um, in order to both utilize your local resources to its maximum degree, and also to serve those vulnerable first, you need to shift your system to be that of a more triage base. That those who are most vulnerable access services first. And that is the mandate that has been put down to the country that communities across the nation are uh, working on right now. It is a million times more complicated than what I've tried to break down here because it has to do with both systems, with people, with service providers, with um, uh, overarching components. Um, uh, so what I want to do now is kind of break down what coordinated entry looks like. You know, first is you have, in, in order to identify those who are the most vulnerable, you have to have an assessment tool that works. And we have chosen in this community uh, an assessment tool called, known as the VI Fidel. And attached, what's coming around the room now, is this presentation, but not in this presentation, but attached to what's going around the room now, is an overview of how the VI Fidel works. And the VI SPDAT is a best practice, evidence-based tool that is designed to tell an individual or a family story to apply a score to their vulnerability. And then based upon that ultimate score, it points in the direction as to which type of program or service this individual or family would most benefit from. Um, as we talk a bit later about expanded HMIS, or Homeless Management Information System, uh, one of the beauties about VIs for that is it can be embedded into HMIS. So um, um, that, at a systems level, provides the foundation to implement a coordinated entry system that is fair, that is compassionate, and that works. Because if you kind of consider it a hub, you see that what's happening up here first is that someone it has a pre-screen, right? It's a very small assessment, uh, which will determine whether or not perhaps that person just needs just a touch of assistance, and they can self-resolve. There's really no need for that person to go into a deeper assessment because their need can be met. Assuming that is not the case, they would then receive an additional, uh, additional assessment called the SPDAT, which then leads to master list placing. 
ma the master list is a beautiful and complicated organism. The master list takes all of the VI spadat, all the spadat information that is coming from various organizations because a coordinated entry process is a no wrong door. It's decentralized, it's spread through the community. So this, this agency might be working with this group of people, this agency with this, this agency with this. And all of those scores and the information under, of course, encrypted, confidential, information, whatever, flows into a master list. And then the master list stacks, based upon vulnerability scores, the order in which people should be served. So for an example, <clears throat> let's say you had a the top five people and the number third the third person on the list was the individual who happened to be a veteran experiencing homelessness. <clears throat> that person would have then immediately be plucked off the list by that veteran homeless organization to be serviced and prioritized for enrollment into their program. So the master list is a huge piece of coordinated uh, entry or coordinated care. Um, it also involves case management, also referrals, shelter placement, and housing placement. Um, Ellie, if you can click. Thank you. This tells you where we are. I put my own glasses on. Uh, where we're at in the coordinated entry process. Um, you know, we have established a community process. We have identified populations. Um, national initiatives tell us that we must make local priority populations. This community has chosen to follow the national priorities, top four priorities. Doesn't mean it's the only priority, but the top four priorities, those being chronic and homeless, uh, families, veterans and youth. And that can be an unaccompanied youth or youth or youth of youth. Well, youth are aging out of foster care. So we have done that. We have, we, we, we're in the process of identifying uh, program types. We're in process of reviewing current uh, processes and building from that. Uh, we're designing our structure now. Our assessment tool has been established, and I'm actually very proud to say that the coalition actually sponsored, we brought the actual creator and developer of the VI Sadat from Canada to our community and trained almost 100 case managers on how the VI Sadat works. Um, so I'm proud of that. Financing, and they, uh, the coordinated entry committee is now working on referral processes and um, policies and procedures. We need to test and refine. Um, we're testing offline hard copy now in the veteran population so that we can get a feel as to how to, where the glitches are so that we can adjust them and and change course or, or, or correct course we, we needed before we do full-blown full blown implementation. We just think that's the smart way to do it um, because this is going to require so many uh, case managers and data managers and senior staff um, training that we really don't want to have to keep retraining people. It'll just frustrate people to death. Um, so um, this is where we're at with coordinated entry in our implementation steps. Again, it is required. Um, and you know, I do want to I just want to reinforce that um, you know this is a this is a massive systems change on the ground. Um, uh, it, you know, it changes everything, it shifts priorities, it it, it it is, it is required, you know, we have to do it. It has multiple moving parts, and we really need to have expanded capacity in order to do this right. You know, people hear about the Homeless Coalition, and in their mind, I think sometimes they think that there's a long hallway of offices with a bunch of people in there. The Homeless Coalition staff is two people. It has been two people for a very long time. 
So that's where we need kind of the people power. So that's coordinated entry. Again, there's some backup information that's provided to you, and I'm also happy to answer any questions you have on cars or coordinated entry. Next is <coughs> outreach and education. You know, Monterey County is a high rent, low wage community that has very few available rental units, let alone affordable rental units, let alone affordable rental units willing to accept rental subsidy programs. And I, it is painful for me to come to you today and tell you that we have resources on the ground right now. You know, the um, commonly known as Section 8 uh, uh, vouchers, you know, there is a significant percentage of those vouchers that go unused. HUD Bash, which is a best known as a kind of specialized Section 8 voucher, but targeted only to homeless veterans and their families, a significant number of those vouchers go unused. Um, SSVF, which is the um, uh, veteran money that you hear about on TV all the time, uh, you know, we have those new resources on the ground with for rapid rehousing, and it is almost impossible to actually implement it fully because of a lack of acceptance. <laughs> the Housing Stabilization Program struggles, which is, you know, for, for families to find landlords willing to participate in subsidized rental assistance programs. And if those, if those, if we had all of those slots filled, we would really have made some progress. <clears throat> but we don't. And so one way or another, we have to find a way through targeted messaging to convince landlords and property owners to become willing to participate in subsidized rental assistance programs. That is something that is going to require time, and it is going to require cultivation and nurturing and increased messaging. There is a, and there's no blame to go around here, nobody does it intentionally, but there can be a misperception on the part of some landlords or property owners that someone receiving a, a rental subsidy may not be as a high as higher quality of a tenant as someone on the open market, <coughs> which is incorrect and not true. In fact, <coughs> excuse me, with many of these programs, the landlord actually has more assurances because that individual or that family may have a case manager that is just saying, let's say somebody has playing their stereo at 11 o'clock at night. You know, they have the opportunity to contact that case manager and say, hey, you know, so-and-so's you know, playing their stereo at 11 o'clock at night. Now the landlord doesn't have to deal with it. The case manager that goes to that individual or that family and says, hey, you want to just, you know, dial that radio down you know, at 11 o'clock, people are trying to sleep. But landlords and property owners sometimes don't understand that. And in this particular community, there really isn't a financial incentive for them to participate. You know, I always for some reason say Georgia. I'm not sure why. Um, but, you know, in a lot of communities, there's a real financial initiative or incentive <coughs> for someone to participate because they have a lot of units on, you know, on the market. It's hard for them to keep them full all the time. Uh, their rent costs are low. We can't do it with financial uh, initiative. What we have to do is we have to change the hearts and minds of enough landlords and property owners so that we can actually utilize these programs where we have the support on the ground already. And it is not that people have not tried in the past. It is not through lack of heart on this issue. It just is it, an activity like any other that needs to be nurtured and uh, cultivated and must be consistent. Is that it? Thank you. You're doing a great job.
Um, the next is um, Homeless Encampment Service Coordination. Um, there's, you know, one of the things that um, the coalition did in ramp up activities <coughs> to uh, the homeless census that was conducted, the enumeration was in January, is that for five months prior to January, the last five months of the year, we had people giving us, it was our own identification, or we had people all over the county telling us where encampments were. And we mapped them so that when the uh, census teams were deployed, we made sure they were deployed out into those areas where the encampments were. And, um, you know, uh, other, other activities have disclosed it as well, but for us, um, that activity really showed us that there really is a high level of significant increase in homeless encampments throughout the county. Some, some areas are more visible, some are more, are more highly populated, uh, but they are spread out through the county. So, one of the things that um, we've talked about through these series of discussions is how best can those how can, the, how can the coalition help? And the coalition can help the serve you the coordinating, coordinating entity. So this is basically how it would work. So within a jurisdiction, whatever that jurisdiction is, if there's an encampment that's identified, let's just say Caesar Chavez Park, just making it up, right? Um, let's say Public Works identifies that there are seven people living in Caesar Chavez Park. Public Works, would, instead of just going out to Caesar Chavez Park, and moving the, moving the people along, you know, or cleaning out, or whatever it is. Public Works would then contact the coalition. Uh, the coalition would then have 72 business hours to have a team go out and to basically assess that group, right? So let's say, for example, there's five people there, there's a woman and her child, there's a veteran, and there's someone who is talking about treatment. I don't know, just making it up. That team would then reach out to others in the community and say, okay, we've got to, we've got to figure out what services might work for this group of people. They would then communicate back to us about the time they think is going to be required to work with this group. Let's say 30 days, right? So then the coalition then communicates back to the public works department or the designated department within the jurisdiction and says, okay, listen, we need 30 days to work with these folks. And assuming that there's no significant danger or emergency that happens, because that, you know, we don't want to get into that, um, then the, the, that jurisdiction says, okay, we'll give you that 30 days. And then those folks know that there's a 30-day time frame, right? So within that 30 days, the outreach team has also reached out. Everyone's been spedatted. The outreach team has reached out and brought in the appropriate services to that particular group of people. And um, uh, those options are provided and those referrals are made. It's service integration. It, it, it happens where it's appropriate. And the coalition then goes back to the public works department or whatever department it is and says, okay, now you can go and you have to do cleanup or whatever. These folks have received their options. Um, and we would also, of course, track that, do metrics on that, to make sure that each jurisdiction as well as the county understood uh, what the successes were. I wish we could say it would it'd be a 24-hour emergency response to the hotline, but we're not LA, and we just don't have that capacity. But this structure does work, and it is modeled off, off, off of best practice programs. And then lastly is affordable housing policy and development. Um, <coughs> you know, we know how hard it is to bring housing to the table here in this county. <coughs> you know, efforts were always hard, but um, were extraordinarily exacerbated by the Great Recession, which we're just rebounding from now as well as the uh, elimination of uh, redevelopment in California. That has, that has made significant negative impact on uh, ability to move forward. However, you know, we must 
address this issue. Um, you know, I cannot tell you how many people I speak with on a daily basis, just in general, but, <coughs> but who also tell me, but wait, I hear affordable housing, I hear on the news, I hear, I hear. And I always have to explain to them, you know, 99 times out of 100 times that you're hearing affordable housing, you're not hearing affordable housing for people who are poor or for homeless. You're hearing affordable housing for people who are 100% AMI, 150% AMI area to in the What is really necessary is affordable housing for people who are 0 to 30% area median income. That group, that, or that classification, encompasses people who are homeless and the poor and the working poor as well. Um, and in order, and it's not just about bringing up housing, it's about bringing up the right housing. You know, for some people who fall into um, homelessness or housing instability, it is strictly um, an economic challenge that can be resolved, and so it really is just that affordable housing, which is great. But for others, um, the challenges are greater. They may involve mental illness, physical illness, recovery issues. Um, so to be able to provide the right housing, some housing must be designed for housing first, and some housing must be designed in mind that there's going to be a significant service component to this, which means that when you're talking about how do you make that happen, you have a threefold finance challenge. You know, you got to figure out how to build it. You got to figure out where the water's coming from, where the money's coming from, when's the land coming from, what's the density look like, all of that kind of stuff. You have to make sure that that unit or those units are uh, rent reasonable for the population, which means can subsidy be attached to those units for people. And then you have to you have to identify and fund the services attached to that. So it is a three-pronged challenge, which has about 100 other uh, challenges underneath it. But we must do it. If we are to, to succeed, we must do it. And we can do it as a community. We are smart, and we can figure out how to do that. Um, so systematically, what we want to do is to activate the housing pipeline, which brings together affordable housing developers, um, uh, nonprofits, the community itself, so that we can basically get ourselves uh, projects in readiness, so that when that funding comes, we're ready to start. Because I'm sure you have responded to a NOFA or an RFP where, oh man, it's 60 days out. Well, you can't develop an entire housing development and apply for it in 60 days unless you are a magician, right? And to also activate a, the fund development group, which brings, which brings together business, local funders, and others, so that we can make sure that we have the ability to finance these programs and to streamline coordinating efforts and activities along the way. You know, developing housing used to be a five-year thing. Now, five, six, seven years. It can take a long time. And, and the challenges from the challenges, if we're successful here, is to get from today to there in the wisest way so that um, uh, uh, people who need services get services, they get services that are uh, consumer-based and consumer-friendly, and that uh, we can start taking steps. I'm a strong, strong, firm believer in being results oriented, that's how I'm wired. Um, so I really don't play a lot in the esoteric. Uh, and um, you know, I, I, I'm also a strong believer in small steps. You know, taking small each step builds upon another step, which creates a, a foundation for success. And I think that the 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 way in which to pull all of these pieces together and to um, 
uh, concentrate efforts and to target efforts and to steer efforts is through um, coalition expansion so that we have the ability to focus on these areas um, and move them forward. And, go ahead, sorry, Elliot. <laughs> so, how much is it going to cost? So what I'm asking for, or the coalition that is asking for, and this is for, um, uh, you know, prorated, if you want to call it, 2015-2016, uh, is um, staffing, uh, which brings two additional people to uh, the coalition staff, making us a, a mighty team of four. Um, the operational expense is tied to that. Expanded HMIS, and I want to be clear, that this is not our, our, our um, HMIS cost that we incur at this time. This is to expand HMIS in the coordinated entry to coordinated care area. Um, and then one time cost of 33000 to bring in expert consultancy to move these things forward as swiftly as possible. And then Elliot, if you would just put lastly, and then moving to an actual ongoing annual cost of 217, the expanded HMIS drops significantly down to 35. Because a lot of that is whenever you do a big um, uh, technology upgrade, if you want to call it, very well set up things that have to happen the first time, which don't roll over. So that drop drops significantly, and we also strip out the other one time cost. So we're really dealing with kind of an annual commitment to keep those two staff members on board, the operational expenses attached to them, and then the hard costs associated with the expanded HMIS that are tied directly to coordinated entry. Those four components that I've reviewed with you today are designed to complement each other, to build with, with um, on top of one another, and to uh, develop a pathway to success. So, I'm sorry if I went on too long. I really tried to pull it as quickly as possible. But in a nutshell, that is the presentation. And again, attached to your hard copy attachments, there is an overview on how the VIS the DAT works. There's a paper on um, the intersection between housing and health, which includes some comparative costs, and also uh, some affordable housing, 0 to 30 percent AMI um, discussion topics. And maybe I can just get a couple of wrap up comments, and I don't know if any of my colleagues have, have wrap up comments as well. But a couple of things, you know, that this doesn't address what we need to keep our eye on. Um, there is substantial need for um, support in housing. Um, and a lot of that kind of, kind of works with my colleagues in behavioral health and their partnerships in the community with new contracts. And um, there's been conversations initiated with the California Alliance for Health around the section with the uh, section of the legislative waiver and the ability to um, finance uh, to, to work on uh, health home concepts for high cost, high kind of need individuals, oftentimes when these individuals have included entry into emergency rooms. So that's something that is of interest to the, uh, the alliance. It's something of interest, I think, to the community. Yeah. Um, but it's something that we have to figure out how to finance, but not only how to finance, finance is probably the easier part. The harder part is actually the recruitment and training of the people who can actually. Uh, qualified for finance, a lot of a better way to put it. I mean, we need to have you know the, the pool of masters on the staff to, to draw down and supervise uh, the, the outreach workers. It's something that you know, CSUB is a great partner in uh, working through that that piece. But the financing through health reform um, in, the, in the past, uh, many homeless individuals were not eligible for Medi-Cal. Today, with health reform, they are. And so that gives you a tool to, to address that. This isn't that piece of the equation. That's something that you know, really needs to be working through, through county departments and then through the broader list of, of the providers. Um, 
it's support for the concept of affordable housing. Um, but that's really something that's in the hands of local jurisdictions, planning committees, etc. Um, you know, the coalition can give ideas, but it's not the, it's not the, you know, the jurisdiction's planning arm. And this, I don't think, makes any presumptions that it, that it, that it, it would be that. The, the second idea is, you know, as my understanding talking to, to Catherine, is that um, the foundation is the assessment piece. But if we are building capacity of the coalition, you know, to leverage that foundation to get get more more than uh, just ours. So I don't know, Sid or I'll start there any comments. I can, I can add a comment after Sid does. If you'd like to hear how behavioral health has approached it with our population of those that have significant <coughs> mental health issues and are homeless, I was going to talk a little bit about our contract with Interim. But I see their executive director is here. She might be better suited to talk about the services she provided. It's uh, really based on housing first, supported housing, outreach, and engagement. Barbara, would you like to elaborate a little bit sure. on that? Um, I'm Barbara Mitchell. I'm the executive director of Interim. And um, we're, I'm also the vice president of the Coalition of Homeless Providers. And head, uh, I'm a founding member of the coalition. I've sat on the board for over 20 years. Um, so interim provides a variety of supportive housing outreach services and um, we collaborate with behavioral health we use an intensive integrated services model to get and keep people housed and that is really the tricky part is keeping people housed and i really want to emphasize you know i have been i have developed housing in this county for over 30 years and you know the federal government has swung back and forth and said, hey, the private market should take care of all of this, and we just need to pump you know vouchers into the private market and it'll all work out, and we don't need to develop more housing. That method doesn't work because every time the housing market gets tight, then landlords say, wow, I can get way more. I can get a Defense Language Institute student that will pay 30 percent more than the fair market rate through the military, and. You can't, and we have people housed in units that have been incredibly successful, and when the leases come up, the owners refuse to renew them. And what they say is it has nothing to do with this individual, it's I can get way more money on the open market. So we have vouchers we can't even place in housing. And so I just want to emphasize, the private market is not going to take care of this problem for us. It is actually a problem that governmental agencies working with nonprofits are going to have to resolve. It will. Not, it might go a small amount into the private market, but talking to landlords will only do so much. It's really money. And I just spoke to another county, and I found out that one of the strategies they're using is they are going into apartments that don't meet the housing quality standards and they are using private money and fixing up those apartments for landlords, and they are spending a lot of money doing this, then they are placing individuals into those units, and then they are guaranteeing like $10,000 worth of damages in these units. Now, this is another county that's doing it, but it's a very expensive methodology, and it's probably a better strategy because you can't guarantee those apartments will then stay with those people so that it's a better strategy for a nonprofit or a governmental agency to actually control the units or to have very long term. So, you know, this is a partnership. We've been working with the County of Monterey on the McComb program <coughs> for over uh, 12 years. And it's a national model of intensive integrated services and outreach and housing, but it's not cheap. And at the moment, I'm sitting next to my colleagues from the city of Salinas asking them if they're a motel for sale somewhere um, in Salinas um, because you know there's so many challenges you know I, you need uh, you need housing like today for the person who's walked into your office and can't stay on the streets one night longer I mean it's very complicated and everybody is different in this there isn't a one size fits all thank you what about people who are dying out there? Pardon me? What about the people who are dying out there? That's the problem is you have someone who today needs housing. It's yeah. not that They're you... Dying. That, yeah, it's not that they can wait 
a week, two weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like being discharged from hospitals too early and people having heart attacks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I should answer questions from court. The chair wants to say. I'll go ahead and finish the name. I'll go. Hold on. Let we're going one by one. Let Ms. Mitchell finish. I'm and then, finished. And okay, uh, Kathy, do you have the? I, I know Elsa. You want to make it? Yeah, I just wanted to add that you know both departments, the health department and social services, are here making the recommendation that um, we move forward to develop a coordinated system so that we can begin to address some of these issues. And if the board um, members here wish to give us direction in terms of beginning to work with the community homeless uh, coalition to be able to build a plan, uh, help find the financing sources for it, uh, both departments are willing to move that forward. So you, you need a, a, a recommendation from this committee on this on this uh, financial request on both items, correct? So, yeah, let me, so, so the, the question would be, you know, what health department and social services have started to kind of look at how we can find access you know, between the internal resources that that are coming available in the current year and the future year to looking outside of our organization. But you know, if we have direction from the board to you know, pursue the, the work to put together and financing for this proposal or some version of this proposal, we are prepared to start with fairly quickly and if I remember what I said, we need to come back to the, um, to the budget committee with that financing plan and or by the end of the year or prior to the year. So, uh, just for everybody's sake, um, we're going to deal with this financial request right now and then I'm going to open it up, completely open to the public related to this report any questions or comments or suggestions or anything else related to homelessness so, <coughs> so uh, I guess I wanted to let's see so I want to clarify something um, because uh, it's as I understand it the coordinated entry is something that is being required it's a process that the uh, coalition agencies are going to have to follow, right, to, in order to comply with the federal uh, mandate. And, and the request for staffing is actually uh, separate. It would allow uh, for some of these other activities to happen, the, um, the outreach and education, uh, the encampment work, and maybe participating with uh, efforts on affordable housing rentals? Well, actually, the expansion activities really directly go to the coordinated entry process because there's, there's massive components built in under each one of those broad things that you see, which both from a service, set, uh, service um, side to a technology side to a system side, which require that um, expansion. Uh, well, for example, um, <coughs> the expanded HMIS. Um, one of the components will uh, will be that for those, say, a grassroots organization who's providing housing, who's not in, they're not a member of the coalition. Maybe they're mostly volunteer based. They don't have a lot of capacity, right? But they want to make sure that the people that they serve can enter into coordinated entry, right? Well, using technology with expansion, you know, we'll be able to, through a phone, it's encrypted, of course, but you will not require an HMIS license to do a SPDAP. You can do a SPDAP with somebody on the phone, and then hit a button, and then that information travels through cyberspace into the master list. So it allows coordinated entry or coordinated care to expand much broader than the traditional service homeless service organization who's working in the mainstream. And if, and if I understand what you're saying, and it looked to me as the information I'm reading, that the uh, cost for the expanded HNIS is a critical piece to this. Yes. I don't see, so anyway, I'm just trying to, I just, I have some concerns. I think there are some really good ideas being presented. Um, I don't, uh, it's not clear to me um, how the city of Salinas is participating, how this dovetails with some of the things they're talking about. Um, 
I don't see how, I don't, I don't exactly know where we are with the 10 year leaving home plan. Um, that is comprehensive. Yeah. And I, I would like to see us, I mean, if there's funding available, I'd like to see us find a way to get that implementation, get that umbrella going so that all of these individual efforts fit. Um, I'm very concerned about sort of a piecemeal reactive thing and um, you know the civil grand jury is looking into issues of homelessness and so I think it would behoove us to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward and so what I'd be interested in if we're really if the recommendation um, is as Elliot said a systemic um, uh, process and as Elsa said you know of, of creating a coordinated system to me that means finding a way to implement the Leave Me Home Plan um, and there are probably pieces of this that fit within that, but I think as a, as a policy decision maker, rather than having us running off in various directions um, that may be good, I'd like to make sure that we are thinking it through and, and making a coordinated uh, effort. Um, and you know, obviously there are a number of people you know, at your table at the coalition, um, but you know, I hear uh, you know, I hear talk of the city of Salina saying, well, we might need to have a position and we might have this money, and where's that going to fit? And I think it's part, I think it is uh, the responsibility of the, the county and that whole leadership team to help put together the, the Leave Me Home plan to make sure that we are focusing on implementing that. You know, that's been in place, that plan's been in place for a number of years. It doesn't seem like we have the local capacity to actually implement it, so I think it, what I'd like to do is really have staff work on how are we going to get the get that capacity here locally to get to get that implemented and then have some of these efforts be able to come in in a synergistic way um, and you know and really I mean, there's an urgency here and so it's uh, kind of concerning that to me that that we're looking at this and that that feel piecemeal and not maybe terribly well coordinated. Um, and thought through, um, rather than focusing on really implementing something that real, that was thought through, that is best practice, that is in line with the federal guidelines, and um, so that's those are uh, those are my thoughts. And I would just say too, I appreciate your the interest is critical um, in affordable housing. Um, and in case you're not aware, there is a regional mm -hmm. effort going on, and, um, and the participation of the the housing the homeless advocates would be incredibly uh, valuable uh, in that conversation. We have most of the cities in the county, uh, as well as the county and, and uh, surrounding counties, identifying opportunity sites within their jurisdictions that are in, you know, close to services, uh, walkable, close to schools, so that um, they're not going to be huge projects, but um, really looking, knowing, having those opportunities identified, ready to go, having them be in places where we can get transit-oriented development and have to trade funding to bring the cost down so that we really are able to accommodate the, the wide range um, of, of needs in the community that really, those needs have not been addressed for decades. And if I can just respond, because I just want to well, hopefully give you a sense of relief, that all roads lead back to the Leaving Home Plan. And you are absolutely correct that, you know, you know, these activities are a piece of, a critical piece of the strategies and articulated goals and objectives contained within the tenure plan. So all roads lead back to the plan. Everything that needs to be coordinated up under the plan, absolutely, I completely agree with you. Yeah. Thank you, Mary Beth, for just adding another piece of that. I mean, part of the conversations in the of this was kind of use of the um, assessment tool that we can work with and see and discharge planning which is actually one of the key parts of the plan. So this gives the, um, the team and the pivot at a better tool to then access housing resources on top of the recent development of the uh, rest at home with the um, which uh, I was <laughs> What's the new name of Shelter Plus? Never mind. But, but yeah, it gives, yeah, it gives, you know, it, it does provide that resource along with the path. Obviously, I think you know, one of the, the big challenges facing you know, not just our community, but communities across the state and communities across the country is that the challenge of, of housing. I had the, the, the joy yesterday having dinner with my counterpart in Los Angeles County, um, and it gets, you know, this, you know, the, the uh, I know one 
point that it came out recently and said, let's stop talking about ending with the widow. He keeps saying we're ending with the old in so many years, and nothing's wrong. And that's really is kind of unfortunate. It's a struggle with the economy, with you know, what's happening with housing. Uh, it's, I mean, that is foundational. And, you know, my guess is, I mean, I what, what he says, Supervisor Parker, the work of the jurisdiction is key, but participation so, um, what do we want to do this week? We got, just got a report on this. Uh, we got uh, we got a request. Mm -hmm. you want to do uh, well, uh, I'm concerned that this particular request is not. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not interested in supporting this particular request at this time. What I'd like, if there is money, I'd like a, uh, a more um, complete plan for how this, how we're going to implement the Leave Me Home plan. You know, I look at some of the, you know, the discussion about landlords and property owners. Um, you know, how the resource center uh, is building those relationships. Um, more need to be built, but you know, maybe there. Uh, a place where some funding can be leveraged. I just feel like this is this is a good idea, but to me it, it feels a little um, kind of reactive and, and piecemeal. So what I'd like to see is for the staff to uh, come back with you know maybe some of this. You know, I'm thinking about the encampments. That's great, but you get people. Where are people in encampments going to go? We don't. The problem is we don't have places for them to go. So you know maybe a, a strategy for making them safer, making them, you know, I don't know what it is, but I just worry that this is not uh, thought through uh, in a way that um, is going to help us uh, address the, the problem even in the, in the short term. So what I'd like to see is uh, how are we going to implement um, Leave Me Home? What are the priorities in the Leave Me Home plan that we can start working on? Uh, something just a little bit more uh, comprehensive. So, let me ask this. The Homeless Coalition has been working on this proposal for how long? About three, three and a half months. Three and a half months. So what happens with sometimes at a subcommittee level like this, we either unanimously agree on a motion or we come out of here split. So I think today, me and Supervisor Parker are going to come out split. Because I, I, I believe we need to act on this proposal. Yes, right, yes. These folks have provided services. That the urgency stuff, and I'll take public comment just on this item, and then we'll close off this item and take um, uh, uh, comments related to um, dealing with encampments and stuff. Even though it's not, it's it's in this report, but it's not. Uh, we we. Um, we make it, we're probably going to have to have a special meeting just to meet with what's going on currently right now within 30 days, this committee. Um, I'm thinking that that um, this this uh, report, because we don't have consensus between uh, us two up here, that we may, we, uh, I would think that we may want to consider forwarding this whole proposal to the full board of supervisors, which we've done before. And let the four or five of us weigh in on this request, um, and, and, and uh, that way it's neither or other. And so what we'll do is um, provide that direction to the full board that this committee could not reach consensus on this proposal, and probably try to get that scheduled within the next 30 days. Okay. Sure, yeah. um, we, we can do that, and I guess we can include the, the budget as part of that request too, so that we all can Yeah, that. my thing on, on the budget side on this, I would like for us to look at finding a financial solution to this request. If possible, not to the end of the calendar year. I would like to see this happen financially uh, in terms of options within 30 days. So I just want to be clear, so I know we'll be bringing it back to the full board at first. So we'll bring it to the full board 
a proposal to take into consideration comments from this committee and we'll add in whatever financing you know we you know, Ray and I have not completed that part. We want to kind of get a sense of the committee before we complete the, uh, the financing side of it. So we'll bring that to the full board by the third of the day. And, and it's, it's not out of respect, not because I, I disagree with what Supervisor it is, it is, is saying and her, her concerned about. Um, but when we hear this, the full board in 30 days, it just you know, you know me already. I'm basically saying at that time I will say uh, financially, just make it happen. So that's what I'm going to be saying. And there may be enough votes for that. There may be, and we never know how this may wind up. And, you know, but there may not be nothing. The board may just want to say, hey, wait a minute, just wait. So, okay. So, can I just before yeah. you do that? So, one thing that, I mean, it sounds to me there are elements of what are being brought forward that I think are important to go forward with. My concern is, 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 is what's the staffing for? I don't think that, that, but I see. Um, and I don't know if that's the best way to use the resources, but it seems to me that the assessment tool, um, I, I, I assume that exists or something, um, but there may be some costs associated with getting it, you know, um, it sounded like there was already a training. I'm just a little unclear, but I think the assessment tool is important. I also think that the, um, the uh, HMIS expansion, uh, that's going to be critical. Um, I, I do understand that there are unfunded mandates that come down from places, but I just um, don't know that it's the responsibility of the county to pay for all of that. I just, you know, I want to understand those issues a little better. Um, but, um, and then, you know, the, if, if we were to uh, bring back uh, the, I mean, I don't know if the folks who helped us develop the tenure plan um, have an implementation arm or the ability to facilitate that in our community, but. I'd like to know what the cost would be of um, that uh, possibly happening so that we can, as we move forward with these various initiatives, that we, ha we have the sense that we're operating from a, a cohesive uh, plan that we have in place. Uh, just a question on, on that. Um, when we were focusing on the I think a specific on the coordination question that came out of the, uh, I think it was one percent of the census. Um, we haven't given the board an update on the new home plan. Um, that's probably something that is also valuable. Maybe on the same day we could schedule more things to give you know, the board of supervisors an update on what's there. And actually, mm -hmm. what would be needed? You know, what are the, what are the missing pieces there? That might that might be a challenge in 30 days. Is the only thing that we'll be able to do. We certainly will you know, try very hard to get it that same day, but, but that sounds valuable. I, you know, my impression of the tenure plan is that I don't know that from the tenure plan and planning committee, they put all the pieces together. And one of the examples that you know, I talked to Catherine about is I don't think we celebrated. Mm -hmm. Take the example of 812, where we um, were putting, you know, in that number, so upwards of a million dollars in uh, housing and resources resources for the Emancipation Foster Youth on page 21, which is, you know, which is a big expansion of services around for that big It's not it's not a panacea, but it's been a big resource and we've had the uh, rest of it. So we've done many of these pieces, but I don't know that we've ever really framed that well for for the community, for the press. And so that's probably something that's really worth going into, but a lot of other pieces on just the terms of identifying housing in an environment where, you know, the recession crushed the resources of many people and evaporated assets. Um, housing costs dropped at that point, but housing costs are now back up. And so it's kind of a, a, a perfect storm of, of housing challenges. 